So everyone, I um, I'm super pleased to have Mike on this whole thing. It's the first time we're doing something like this as well. So it's it's a big start for this to have um, Mike Schlosser on, and you know I'm, I'm pretty fortunate to be calling him my friend as well. And um, I'm just going to throw a little fact out there, Mike, because these guys won't know this, but I know that legends are born on the 15th of January. Can you confirm <laughs> that? I am born on 15th January. That's true. Yeah. So uh, that's proof to everyone. It's actually scientific now that um, the 15th of January is the best day to create arches. Just, uh, just saying for the arches that's thinking of building good arches in the future, that's the date to to really fine pick things. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, Mike, I thank you very much for doing this. Uh, mm -hmm. This is absolutely awesome, and also thanks to Archery New Zealand for organising this. This has been, you know, one of those things that um, we hope to help other archers as well. Then that don't get to see someone like Mike um, very often on a shooting line. The whole point of me trying to do this, Mike, as well, is. You've been incredibly nice to me when I started shooting, you know, as a professional with you guys. We've always had good conversations and I kind of want to use this event to just break the ice a little bit to some archers that might start shooting internationally as well. So they can, you know, see that we are just ordinary people as well and, you know, easy to approach and it's easy to ask us questions about our gear and stuff like that as well. So and that's mainly the, the the thinking that Archery New Zealand had behind this, this whole event. So... Um, I'm just going to start throwing some questions out. I've got some questions on the screen next to me that archers have asked that's on this call. Um, and we'll just go through it, you know, piece by piece. I'm not necessarily going to say this guy asked this question. However, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, bring him up and say this guy asked this question, which I thought was pretty interesting, but I'm going to try and keep the whole thing flowing really well. So first off, I'm going to ask you, what? Day, uh, when did you sort of start your archery career? How old were you? And then mm -hmm. did you start with a compound bow or did you start with a recurve bow? So I was about five to six years old. And my, both my parents were archers. And uh, in the beginning, I went there with, in the buggy. So, in there, like, uh, and from now on, like, I, before I knew, before I could walk almost, I had a bow in my hand. So I started really young. And I think I was about six. I started to uh, get a bit more serious about it. They got me like a, a recurve. I first shot four years recurve. Mm -hmm. And um, it uh, like got pretty serious quick. And uh, I saw like for us, compound wasn't that big back then. It was kind of even like a, a kind of black sheep of the archery in the Netherlands. And yeah. I, somebody at our club had a compound bow. I was about 10, 11, probably around 10. And I was told my parents, like, I want to shoot that bow. And they were all like, okay with it. But my dad said, you first need to shoot the nine average at 18 meters. <laughs> it was kind of like uh, trying to stay, like, keep me away from the compound for a bit longer. So within no time, I shot nine average for the recurve for 80 meters. And then it started like 925. Within no time, I shot that as well. And uh, eventually I was about... I think 11, maybe 12. Um, I told my dad, like, I'm going to shoot compound now. I'm going to quit. And uh, within, uh, like, within a few days, I had a compound. So, oh, wow. oh that's, 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 a, that's a cool way of introduction to, to that thing. So how long did it take you to, you know, I, I'm quite fanatical about shooting as well. So when you got that bow in your hand, obviously I can take that you're already, you know, hooked onto archery, the idea of archery really quick and early on in your life. But when you got that compound, how long did it take you to figure out the bits and bobs involved in a compound? You know, just getting the accurate shooting, the accurate aiming. Yeah. How long did that take? Um, I think about like at least a year. Like for me, um, switching uh, from recurve to compound took me about a year to to be on the same level as I was recurve. I think like. Um, for me, like the beginning, like I shot way less, uh, way less score than I did with the recurve. I was shooting about nine, yeah, a nine point three, nine point four average on, on a recurve. Yeah. When I was that age, and uh, in the beginning, I shot maybe maybe the seven average, eight average at the compound. So it went down quick, like pretty quickly, but it went up quite as well. Yeah. And it took me a while, to, like I think about a year, year and a half, that I was back on, 
on track what I should have been. Right, that, that's cool. Um, then I suppose, you know, you grow up, you're a kid, you've got, you're doing some serious growing as well in your drawing, mm-hmm. so that changes. How much did that affect your competitiveness? So every time you, you sort of start growing, mm-hmm. how many times do you have to change your drawing because you've started seeing maybe, you know, side picture changes, maybe um, a little bit of anticipation in your shot developed with that sort of stuff? Um, I had like a, a bow, like I had a, a, a kid's bow back then. It was, I think it was called the BZ, um Magics, I think. No, it was Hoyt Magic, I think. Hoyt Magic. And um, it was like a bow that you could set like pretty quickly on a different draw line. So I was growing into the bow and the bow could fit me for quite a long time. Yes. And after that, I got a PZ Spider. And um, that one was the same thing. Like you could really grow into it. I think I had like a five inch adjustment mm-hmm. on it. So my parents, like they always wear me when I was practicing so they could keep an eye on it because my dad knows quite a lot of archery as well. Yeah. So he, keep, he kept an eye on me and I was shooting and he helped me a lot in the early stages of my archery career. Right. So when did, when did young Mike break through and started getting noticed by the Netherlands Archery Association as this kid is actually going somewhere? And then um, there is a question in here somewhere. You probably had to make a conscious decision on, right, this is either going to be university for me or shooting for me how did that happen um it was about quite early in my archery career i think i was not even on on close to my max on uh, on shooting capability with the compound yet and i was shooting a fita it was back then that uh, the young kids was 50 meters 40 meters 30 meters 20 meters on, yeah. uh, on fitas and uh, there was a um, back then was uh my own it was a uh, uh, her name was that she was a member of the Dutch team of compound, but she was on the uh, on the end of her career, and she was going to start with um, with art coaching. And uh, the coach of the junior team back then came to her and told her that she lives really close from where I live. Told her to like give that get get a guy uh, to like to train, and she became my coach for uh, for like when I was about twelve to thirteen, and. Um, yeah, from there on, like I got picked up pretty quickly uh, into like a coaching staff, and from there on, I went to the Dutch junior team, and from there on, I went to the senior team. Well, wow, so pretty early on in your career, where any free thing like that happened, mm-hmm. right? So then, then my other question I want to ask that is sort of related to that in any way. So did you did you end up, or are you still are you studying for something while you know while you're sort of shooting around the world as well, or are you just mainly focusing on shooting? Um, I made a decision about when I was 22 to um, quit my university. Mm. It was uh, for us, we have a Dutch rule that you need to be for almost uh, 1,500 hours in school um, to get a degree a year. And with me traveling, that was almost impossible. Mm. So um, back then, the school made a really hard decision for me. Like it was all like, keep studying, stop shooting or stop shooting and goes yeah you know that was really difficult for me mm-hmm. so i decided to uh, talk with my parents first it was about christmas and uh, i was like my my school was doing really good like i was doing getting good grades and everything but the school was like you're just not having the hours so we don't like we cannot let you pass so mm-hmm. it was pretty quickly and my parents said because i already had my um i have a degree in accounting so I was oh, just getting like a PhD in, in, in accounting as well to become a, like a rest, registered accountant. Yeah. Um, it was really difficult for me to make a decision because my parents were always really like, you need to finish school, you need to finish school. Mm. So I decided to talk with them during Christmas and I thought it was going to be a really difficult Christmas for me. So I kind of postponed it and postponed it and postponed it. And like the last day before I went back to, uh, I was back then living at the training center. Yeah. And, uh, before I went back to the training center, I asked them, like, I told them, like, I guys need to tell you something. And they were like, we knew there was something up because the whole Christmas year were weird. And I'm like, yeah, this has happened. This is going to be. And my mom, I thought she was going to be furious because, <laughs> like, it was going to be like, are you stop shooting? And uh, for my mom, education is really important. And she was like, no, um, you have your degree in accounting. So 
you can always pick up after our archery career, you can pick up and get studying again. So she was like, you have something now and go try to achieve something in archery. And that was about, I think a year after I became world champion. So she was like, you already have like a build up archery career mm. and you can maybe get better at it and be, uh, yeah, be where you, yeah, be what you want, you know, like travel the world and see people yeah. and, you're now in the age that you can do that. And if you're like get too old, then that's going to be impossible. And studying you still can do it in an older age. So yeah. I was really relieved that I, that she made that decision for me. Yeah, I'm glad as well. I've, I've been, you know, if, even before I turned shooting, you know, a little bit more serious, I've always, you know, looked at you obviously as, you know, being the pinnacle of archers, you know, one of the, the top archers in the world. So for me, it's been awesome to see you progress as that. I remember seeing a very young Mike <laughs> when the... <laughs> Mm -hmm. the, the 720 um, sort of format in world archery and it was it was bloody awesome to see you know just it, it, it was almost like you were surprised as well when you won so that moment in your life how how massive was that for you um for me the 2013 world championship changed a lot but to be honest i think for me the year after when i won vegas the 2014 vegas was way more important in <laughs> status and everything like am i like i would rather put um uh, my like winning world uh, the world championships not over a uh, vegas champion like oh, if wow. i need to like make a list like with my achievements like my vegas champion is higher than my world uh yeah world championships yeah i, th I think um i think sometimes like us in new zealand um there's not a lot of people that that really appreciate or sees how massive vegas is it's, yeah Oh, the first time I went there, which was 2018, which is the first year I met you as well, it's like, whoa. <laughs> this yeah, is, it is crazy. This is like, massive. Yeah, like, like four and a half thousand archers and maybe like what, close to 10,000 people coming to visit there through the weekend. Yeah. And any, anything can happen. Like mentally, anything can happen. So yeah. that brings me on to some of the next question. Like Nelson Chu has asked this. Ryan Jones has asked this, which is awesome to see. Uh, Ryan is one of our really um, talented young archers, and I'm really yeah. excited to see him go through this as well. Um, Akuhuta asked the same sort of question. So, what? How do you deal with you know those hard situations? Like you go onto a line now as mm -hmm. Mike, and you know not only do you expect from yourself to shoot good, but you know everyone else, your sponsors or whatever, everyone's mm -hmm. expecting you to shoot good. How do you deal with that pressure and also the pressure and trying to tick that personal achievement for you mm -hmm. and winning that event. So how do you deal with that, Mike? Uh, for me, when I shot the 600, uh, the world record, was really difficult for me to go after that, to go to competitions, because I always like felt like that I was expected to shoot the 600, but it's a really difficult score to shoot, of course. So I <laughs> felt a really lot of pressure on, on my shoulders to compete like every time, shoot the 600, shoot the 600. And it took, uh, it was really a lot, like it took me a lot of effort to get rid of that. And eventually I even didn't enjoy going to competitions anymore because the pressure was just too high from the people and what I thought. But I talked with a, a mental coach about it. And she just said, like, go enjoy these competitions. Like, just go there, have fun, and don't yeah, let anybody like tell you something about it. Just go shoot, do your thing. And um, that helped me a lot just to like talk with my mental coach about stuff like that. Yeah, uh, that uh, again, that, that's pretty important, eh? And like, uh, I tried to tell some of the young archers when they asked the same sort of questions, just remember why you got into the sport, you know? Mm -hmm. You got exactly. into it because you enjoyed it or because you might be a perfectionist at trying to achieve something. So mm -hmm. remember the core of that and don't be afraid to lose. Like, mm -hmm. windy days, rainy days, anything mm -hmm. can happen. So, don't put, don't build it up. So that that's a really good way of one answering of the, the question. One of the things that I learned through yeah, my career is like you will always lose more than you win. That's fun for sure. <laughs> Isn't that right? No, that's yeah. that's that's awesome. Now, I'll ask these two questions almost together, but I'll ask this this part first. How many arrows do you typically shoot a day? Um, I shoot indoors. I shoot less than outdoors uh, because I feel like that the indoor. Is you need to uh, not practice as much as you do outdoors, and um, I think the indoors is about 150 to 200, 
and my outdoor day is about 300 to 250 hours a day. Wow, that's a lot. And, um, you know, the fine specimen that you are, Mike, do you go to the gym? Yes, I do. Yeah, I recently day, started again. It was, <laughs> on the, during the lockdown, it was really difficult to go to the gym, but I, uh, like about a month and a half ago, I started again. I and can tell. You look really buff, mate. Like, yeah, <laughs> you look good. You look good. Thank you. Um, so, you know, at, I saw a question pop up here, which is good as well from Justin. Um, so there you are. You're shooting the 600. The world's blown away. This guy's mm -hmm. just shot the 600. How amazing is that? You know, and then, then they start calling you Mr. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Did that have an effect on you? That definitely had an effect on me because that was also the part of, of the pressure that I felt because um, stupid things, but like uh, if you go to like a local competition and you shoot like a, like a nine and then they come to you and they're like, hey, you're not Mr. Perfect anymore, you know, and stuff like that. There's just really stupid things, but they like they heard it at the end, you know? Yeah. Like it was, it was really cool. Um, about a year ago, me and Mike shot Mikhail and... Um, I uh, don't know how people, how many people would have noticed, but Mike actually shot another 600 in Macau a year ago mm -hmm. with the bow that he, you know, just got um, the the weight, um, what is it, what is your model called? The Invicta. Mike? Invicta, the Invicta was just launched a few months ago and oh, a few weeks ago at that time and Mike shot the perfect score. Now I know when I spoke to Mike about the bow and we we're just, you know, talking while we we're shooting our round and you were saying that the bow wasn't even shooting as good as you would have liked it to shoot, but you mm -hmm. still managed to shoot a 600. So, yeah. you know, what, what was cool about that as well for me, not only to be there with you, but, you know, you and me were talking about things not even related to archery. We were talking mm -hmm. about house buying and stuff like that. So when you're shooting a competition, this is sort of just a personal question for me. When you're shooting that competition, I know that sort of stuff helps me just for a second, just not focusing on that 600 that's hanging over your shoulders. Yeah, sure. Does that help when, you know, your fellow competitors or friends talk about stuff while you're shooting? Um, I think so. That definitely does. Like if you're just sitting there by yourself, not talking to anybody, you're just going to think about your progression or your, your score or your achievement that you want to make. Look, if you're going to talk with people or in general, like you're not going to be talk, thinking about it that much. But it's still in the back of your head, that's for sure. And yeah. I also like people always tell like, don't um, like keep your score in your mind or whatever. But I think that's like for me, it's really important to keep an eye on my score. Mm -hmm. But it's like what you mentally do with that thought, you know? Like I know exactly how much points I'm at. I know exactly how many nines or tens I shot. But it's what you do with it in your in your mind with it. Like I know what I shoot and I'll know what my score is, but I'm not going to think like, oh, no, I need to shoot a six to shoot the world record or now I need to do this to win the match or. Yeah, yeah. That, that's pretty important. And like, I'm going to put something out there. So uh, these guys know what we talked about as well at that time. We were talking about training as well. And uh, Mike, Mike believes and he stands by this, that um, there's a world archery app that's called Match to Match. And if you ever wanted to, you know, help yourself out, especially if you're doing some, you know, serious distance like we are away from the rest of the world. Go onto that app and shoot against Mike. Or if you're a recurver, go and shoot against someone that's really good. And think about that match as being a real match. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that you think that's pretty important, eh, Mike? Yeah. I am um, sometimes, like, uh, quite regular, especially now I'm preparing for competitions. If you go on the, on the World Archery site, you can see like previous uh, World Cups or World Championships or whatever. Like you can see different uh, events and you can find like, um, a, like a, a score list. You can see the qualification and the bracket system. You can see everything. And I sometimes print that out and I'm going to shoot a day and I'm going to like simulate the competition. So I'm going to mm -hmm. shoot a qualification round and see where it ranks me in that, in that particular event. And then I'm going to see, okay, I'm, I'm ranked seventh. So I put myself uh, at the seventh place and I'm going to shoot that bracket that I should have been. So I'm going to shoot the bracket and I'm going to see like, okay, my opponent is at 145 there. So I need to shoot like a 145 or better of like a 146 or better to beat him. So to go to the next round. And from there on, I try to simulate competitions. 
Mm. Yeah, that, I, that's a really good point. And um, I thank Mike for sharing that information with me and us all on this as well. Because I think that's a that's a really cool tool to use, like an organization like us that try and develop archers. I, I think that's an invaluable tip that someone can give you. Um, now, so we coming back to shooting like a 600 or just shooting any competition. Mm -hmm. who, what do you do to get yourself prepared and get ready for that schedule or that mental space to be in? This is a question from Ryan Judge that I thought was really a good question. Um, for me, it's really difficult to particularly prepare for one competition because normally my schedule is about 35 competitions a year. So sometimes I have three or four uh, weekends back to back to have competitions, so I cannot prepare just for one or just for the other one. So I need to really prepare for like both my bows are on point, myself is on point. So I'm not particularly going to prepare for that competition or this competition, but I'm just make sure that I'm going to be good for all of them. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. Um, now, uh, something that came from Alison. Um, but I wanted to know how would you best describe that moment when you're standing, you're aiming, you know your dots in the middle mm -hmm. and you want to execute that release. Is there anything that mentally you have to focus on to make sure you get that constant regular release that's sort um, of repetitive? For me, it's really different. Like um, sometimes when I'm definitely now practicing without any uh, form of competition, I'm just practicing to practice kind of and i'm sometimes mm. gonna start shooting too quick so when i'm at the end like i'm draw back i aim and I'm, I'm settling in i just need to tell myself i keep like just keep patient and just keep patient and just wait till it go off and that, that's really important to me at this moment yeah so um obviously we've got two seasons in archery this is just a question that i uh, made you've got an indoor and an outdoor season so for you, especially, I know you've got a very tight schedule in a usual mm -hmm. year, so we're going to pretend this is 2019 or 2020. So you... Uh, Let's just start it. Oh, sorry. I have to go. You're only literally, what, two weeks at home, and then you have to go to another competition. And before you know it, it's like some like oh, reading yeah. shoot or something. So, how do you keep yourself? What do you do um, just to keep me yourself like start to finding sharp? something else? And archery is really important as well. Um, I try not to put all my focus on archery. Sometimes when I'm, I'm home, I'm not feeling like it. I'm just going to play some video games or watch some, some others. Because if you, at least like when I do, like when your life is all about archery, sometimes a good shot off to something else is really good as well. Mm. And for me, trying to be as fit as possible is just try to hit the gym sometimes and also shoot to your arrows when you can. So it's because sometimes my competitions are like I arrive Tuesday morning about 8, am on the airport and thursday i need to leave again at around that time so sometimes like i'm, I'm coming back is wash my clothes and then just shoot some arrows like just keep keep form mm. and uh, that means you and it doesn't mean that shooting on 50 meters or like sometimes you can be also just blank bail just to mm. keep your form and your your shape in it because flying takes a lot of toll of your fitness in general mm. yeah, so so I personally find when I do that sort of stuff, I just I just try and shoot and not even score, not to yeah. stress myself out if I'm not shooting a specific score that I'm aiming to shoot at that moment. So that that's what I, I mean. Last year for me was extremely hard getting into you know all of these shooting, and then I just realized all of a sudden just take it easy. Again, it comes sort of back full circle to what we spoke about before. Remember what is important. Yeah, what are you doing like, for? Yeah, yeah, you know that. And I think that's pretty important. So um, your, when you start a year, how do you start making your goals? So obviously, knowing you, you'll go to every competition thinking and knowing that you'll win it. Yeah. So 
you've got strategies on how you would get yourself mentally fit for all of those. So how hard is it? I'm not going to ask you how you do it because I think that's a really big question. And, and I think you probably don't even think about it as deep as you want to think about it. But how do you just, you know, keep a sane mind? Because you might go to a competition and, you know, brutal competitions like Lancaster Archery that Mike has won this year. You could go there one weekend and miss out literally by an X. Yeah. And next weekend, you've got to perform in the hardest competition in Vegas. So the bounce back. How do you just get yourself over there and get into the next competition? Sometimes just be like as, as simple as it is. Just like there are more than one competition. You know, like it's not like a week of archery that I need to prepare four years to go to the, the games. Like we have multiple competitions that are quite high on there, like like Esther and then Vegas and Reading, like all those competitions are pretty high on our list as well. So sometimes it's just really simple thinking like, oh, I messed up this competition. I should have been better. But like, don't be like, don't think too much about your previous competitions. Just go like work on the next ones because there's always a next one. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm going to go back to a question that Nelson Chu asked. Um, he's very interested to know on how do you, uh, process your arrows from building them, testing them. How do you work all that stuff out? Uh, does Mike just have a setup that he knows works, that he's developed, and that is the way he builds his arrows? Or do you, every time when you get a new set of arrows, do you have to build them to a different specification? No, I, especially indoors, I always take the same set. Like, um, I have a set from about, I would say, like, I got them here, so that's, uh, I'm looking at it. <laughs> So that's pretty easy. But um, I've just said about when did I do this? About 2015 when I shot uh, the 600. Yeah. It was pretty funny. Like I went to Neem, I shot at Neem, and uh, I went there with a new set, a new, like complete new setup of, of arrow. I was shooting it back then, 180 grain point, and I went to a 200 grain point. I went from right helical to left helical and, and stuff like that, and different length of arrow. I was just going to try it at the competition. Like I shot some practice with it, and I shot really good. But I came there and I shot the 600. So I came back and I uh, welded my fletching jig to the place where it is. Like, it's just so it had always had the same one. So, um, and from there on, like, I've been shooting like five years, the same kind of setup for indoor arrows. I feel like outdoors is a bit different because you're like different bows need different spines, but mm -hmm. indoor is pretty easy to get away with, um, with the same arrow. Yeah, that's. That's awesome. I, I like the way you answer that question because, you know, here's Mike Schlosser. Any company that produces arrows would happily throw Mike as many arrows as they can possibly get to him. But here's a guy that prefers to shoot, you know, as one set of arrows for over five years almost now. And mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure uh, Mike is going to shoot a competition this weekend in Switzerland. You are going to use those same arrows again, aren't you, Mike? Yeah, I am. Um... I uh, normally make about new arrows about uh, every season, like two, like 24 new arrows. Yeah. But I normally do the whole year with that. But they're all like my inner setup has always been the same. Like for the last five years, like I can take, I can take an arrow that I shot five years ago and it will land in the same spot as I wanted to do now. Yeah, see that I like that as well. It's it's really awesome, um, you know, for the younger archers to know this as well. Um, then. Uh, some people want to know how your sight picture will look at 18 or 15 meters. Is it a very busy picture or do you just settle nicely and get a good shot away? Um, I would say like, it also depends on the form of the day. Like there are some days that I'm wiggling a lot, but also some days that I don't leave the X. So um, what you need to kind of see it as, as I, I always explain this to the younger archers here, like you need to see it as, as driving your bicycle or driving a car. It's like, you're moving on the street as well, you know, like it's not a one straight line, but don't try to correct it all the time. Like just make it a smooth ride. Just try the same doing that with, with, with shooting, like try to make a smooth movement instead of like going like, oh, middle, 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 middle. Because that's gets you really jerky, like side picture. Just try mm -hmm. to keep it as smooth as, as possible into the middle kind of. Cool. Then I'm going to ask something that I already know the answer with. So I'm going to just quickly go back to the 600. That... 600 that you shoot how well was your bow tuned um not at all <laughs> i am um, 
I was tuned really good, but I, I, I made some mistakes that I, I did. Um, it was a prototype boat. It was the one of the first prevails that ever came. Oh, no, not even prevail. Uh, was it? The Podium X it was. It was one of the first podiums that came off, off there. And I got it. And it was having the wrong modules in it. <laughs> but dumb me, I put one longer module in it and one I kept the same. So I yeah. was shooting with two different kinds of modules and I, I twisted my cables a lot to match that module and my draw length. Mm -hmm. And I shot it like that and I was like, why is this Boeing? Like, it was really weird. Like the bow was not sounding good. And it was not like, I was like, oh, this is really weird. And I shot that 600 with a bow that had two different modules in it. <laughs> that's awesome. You know, that, that, that's pretty cool as well. Cause People that know me know how I'm. I'm not a Tim Gillingham crazy yeah. about shooting boats, but I I sit closely up there. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm really, you know, particular about yes. how I tune my boats. But saying that, in the last couple of years, I've sort of slowed down, especially when it comes to like an indoor setup. Like mm -hmm. I'm more worried about how the o, the bow would aim and how yeah, my true. shots would feel when it breaks than I am about if it's even shooting a bullet hole. And that's what I've been telling some of my younger archers. It's like mm -hmm. Let's get the boat to shoot. If yeah. it appears two inches to the left or up or down, let's just let's get it to shoot. Let's get good shots and let's mm -hmm. see what it scores like. And then maybe we can play with the tuning after. I always say that as well. Like indoors, like it's way more important to have a good aiming bow than a, a good shooting bow. Because yeah. if you aim in the middle, like I have an arrow that almost turns around, see who shot it, will still land in the middle. Like if you aim in the middle. But yeah. if you're having a bow that doesn't aim in the middle then then you're in trouble in my yeah. opinion yeah no I, it's it's funny like I've, I've sort of changed it the last few years for me like a field bow like something that i would shoot different distances with mm -hmm. that needs to be shooting you know as yeah. good as i can possibly get it to shoot um because i don't want to be playing around too much with my sight i just want to you know have a good setup going into it so i i knew that answer but i needed to ask that so people could <laughs> yeah. actually understand you know the importance of how just a good feeling bow shoots. It's almost like putting on an old shoe sometimes I find. It just, it just freaking works. I don't know why yeah. it just works. Exactly. Um, exactly. Then another question, uh, I'm actually quite surprised nobody asked this. I know that the answer to this as well, but people that know would notice that Mike shoots a lot of weight on his front stabilizer and least weight on his back stabilizer. Mm -hmm. So, Mike, do you want to tell these people how that how happened? happened? Yeah, it funny. happened a long time ago. It was kind of a joke. Back then, it was real well. It was like the demand to beat. It was about, I think, 2012-ish, 2011. I just joined the, the training center in, uh, in our country. And um, the kids were like, oh, you cannot choose. Like, we were like just joking around and trying a lot of stuff. Like, I came to the training center and I... At the, the equipment to test stuff and i was doing that as well and they were like making a joke like you cannot put as much weight as rio does because rio was shooting that kind of setup back then it was like the front weight and the side side wire straight to the left and uh, it started as a joke like it started as a joke and i put on like every single weight i had in my my bookcase <laughs> so i grabbed my spare spare bow and i put all the weights on and i went from about I think 12 weights to, to 26 or something like that. And uh, just not front stabilizer. I didn't change anything on my side stabilizer because I like how the, the bow felt and how my bow was in the middle. So I just put on like a lot of weight in the front and I started shooting and I'm like, oh, this is heavy. This is crazy heavy. But my side didn't move at all. I'm like, I'm onto something. I'm onto something. <laughs> so I started shooting and I started like, shooting 50 hours with that stabilizer because like you cannot start with like that month like for once so i started like 50 hours and 100 hours and then like build up build up build up and eventually i was strong enough to handle it and i was like this is this works this is something i found something <laughs> that's awesome yeah i really like that story the first time you told me i was, I was yeah i was laughing Um, it just shows you sometimes, like I've done it before, and then I shoot it, and I go, "That's, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's good." 
<laughs> so sometimes it just happens that we sort of stumble across it. Um, another question from uh, Justin here. Uh, what exercise do you think will best benefit archery as a whole? Um, like physical exercises yeah, or but, mental? Well, or let's, let's do the physical actually, and the mental is mm -hmm. actually quite a good thing as well. Can you mm -hmm. answer that? Um, for me, it's like try to work as much with loose weights as possible. Like I, those machines are really good to start up, like to get a, in shape, but like eventually start go over to like the weight, like the loose weights, because then you will uh, practice also like the smaller muscles. Because mm -hmm. the problem is with the machines, like the machines only focus on the big muscles. And for us archers, we need our small muscles to keep aiming as steady as possible. Mm. And I always go to the gym and just do like uh, loose weights because that, that makes me uh, feel that I'm a better archer at the end. Mm. Yeah. And I also try to like some, for example, like make some exercises and I do like a, a basic squat, for example. I put like weights uh, with uh, like a, a rubber band on the end. So when you like, to find like get some uh, some uh, core stability as well. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's, a, that's but, like cool. you put the weights in the rubber bands and they move. Of course, when you go up and down, and then you need to like try try to keep as steady as possible. No, that's that's a good one. And mentally, what do you do mentally? Um, before I go to competitions, I try to like visualize uh, uh what kind of uh, atmosphere is there. So when I go to Vegas, I try to invent. I visualize that there's a lot of people that want your attention and like get your attention as well kind of because they're like mm. and uh, when you go to like a auto competition i try to just visualize how it is and and try to shoot some tents in in my head yeah that, that's that's awesome mike um now i'm gonna i'm gonna start wrapping it up so if you guys have any questions that you've thought about that i haven't covered um i don't want to keep mike up too much and i find mm. having these nice and compact is, is quite good as well it keeps everyone's attention I'm going to start transitioning into sort of how we're going to finish this. So um, I'll leave this question for last because everyone wanted to, uh, to know this. And I've been bugging Mike about this for a while. Um, why do you prefer aluminium arrows indoors rather than carbon? And I, I'm pretty sure your answer is not going to be just because Eastern sponsors you, obviously, as well. Mm -hmm. But I know there's actually a good reason behind it, too. Um, for me, an aluminum arrow is just way easier um, to tune. Uh, it's way, way less critical. It's just like for me, I can put it on and, and shoot good scores with it. And also at home um, in the Netherlands and kind of in general in, in, in Europe, we have um, a lot of stranded targets. Hmm. And an aluminum arrow is, is way stronger arrow against that, against that stranded. Like if you shoot foam, it doesn't matter at all. But like if you shoot a lot of stranded like I do, uh, a carbon arrow doesn't last as long as a, as an aluminum arrow. Cool. So what is Mike's big goal? There must be something that you still want to tick off that bucket list that you maybe haven't done before. What is that? Um, oh, I haven't done. Like for me, it's something big. Like for us, um, the World Games is kind of like the Olympic Games for us. Mm. And I still like that. I haven't won that one yet. So that one is really high on my list because, yeah, that's something I think for us, the World Games is something as close as we can get to the Olympic Games. Mm. So um, I think that that one is really high on my list to uh, really make it happen. Cool. So um, you obviously just shot a new world record as well, Mike. Do you want to mm -hmm. just quickly before we wrap up, do you want to just go through that? Because I think that was actually pretty extraordinary what you did. And Netherlands, I think it's just after we started coming out of some of our lockdowns. Yeah, true. It was uh, between our lockdowns and uh, we um, started to have competitions again. And um, it was really uh, like we had a, what was it, about 15 years ago, like even before I, I started really shooting. And a Dutch archer died going to the national championship in the car, had a car accident and he died. And we have like, um, uh, a memorial is called the Aaron for Save Memorial, and it's just Fita. Like it's one of the only Fitas we have in the Netherlands that we can still shoot. And um, the organizer is a really good friend of mine, so he asked me like, "Can you come and like we can have something special? I have some some high level archers want to come, and then we can have uh, like show his respect because it was I think it was his 15th year that he died this year or his 10th year, 
not sure it was like it was a, a yeah and um I went there like I just uh, cited my side marks like a couple of days before and I went there kind of without practice yeah. yeah that's 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 bloody awesome how cool is that to shoot something so special you know on on the dear friends um mm -hmm. special day as well whether that they there or not I'm pretty sure he was you know smiling over you guys and, and mm -hmm. that would have been pretty special that's that's awesome Ollie. Um, now, uh, if you guys have any questions, you better put it now because this is probably going to be one of our last questions. Um, so, Mike, everyone wants to know <laughs> when is Mike going to come to New Zealand? Oh, and like it's it's been on my bucket list for a long time, but just for me, it's really difficult to normally add it into my my like archery career, like my, my archery tournaments, because I normally my all my tournaments are in the US, like you know or you're here in Europe. So it's really difficult to fly to that side of the world between the competitions to have like a holiday, but it's been yeah. definitely high on my bucket list. And, and you know, that as well. like, I've been talking about it. I don't want to come for sure one of these uh, years. Yeah, so when we with them, I promise them I'm going to take him deer hunting as well, which which I'm pretty sure is going to be some, a lot of fun as well. For sure. So that, that's going to be awesome. Um, one final question here from Justin as well. Would you say that trying to keep 100% exact form just add extra stress on yourself? Um, um, he asks because in some of your comps uh, on YouTube, your anchor point seems to change some variation, but you still hit the middle. Um, I feel like that, that if you shoot as, like, as long and as much as I do, Sometimes it's like a feeling that changes that you know what to do to make it still land in the middle. For example, sometimes when it, it's, it's windy, like you know what to compensate for to still hit the middle. And I feel as well with my technique, like sometimes I feel like, oh, I'm not, this is not 100%, but I know to what to compensate to still hit the middle. Yeah, it's it's funny. It's like a split second movement and you, mm -hmm. you, you thinking you're going to hit the release and it's going to go mm -hmm. off. And all of a sudden the wind change or something and Mike just corrects it. And something that you guys don't know is Mike's arrows are actually trained to go in the middle all the time. So the arrows know what to Big do. Magnet. Yeah, as, the, as they fly to the target, that they know what to do. So um, Mike, that is about it. I'm, I don't want to keep these sort of things very long. I want to try and keep it compact. I think everyone has got something out of this. Um, I want to thank you, you know, from the bottom of my heart for this. It's been bloody awesome. It's yeah, firstly, it's great to see you again. I can't thank wait to have me. go and have some dinner or something together when we see each other again. Um, Archery New Zealand, thank you for making this possible. Uh, Lisa has had some hard work that she's put in this. Um, it's been great, and we're looking forward to doing the next one. And, and I'm sure we can have you on again when we do something like this. It'll be great. I'm sure there's going to be more questions popping into people's head. Um, I don't know if Lisa has announced it yet, but I'll put it on here as well. Um, Mike's awesome uh, wife is going to join us next week as well. She's an Olympic recurver, and we're going to be doing the same thing here. So if you want to get interested in that, look out for the Archery New Zealand post. We'll be sharing them soon. Um, I'll communicate with Gabby, um, our top recurver, which is a really good friend of ours and someone I look uh, forward to seeing host an event like this is uh, Stephen Florence. He's, he's one of our top recurvers, and um, I look forward to seeing Gabby next week. <laughs> Thanks. She will uh, she will enjoy this as well. Appreciate it. <laughs> uh, that's and awesome. So, so Thank Mike, you, everyone, for joining us. And, um, yeah. At Tree New Zealand, um, we just really like to thank you for taking time out of your day today. It is greatly appreciated. It's not often that we get someone of your caliber who's prepared to, to give us some time. So we do really appreciate it. And Thank yeah, you. we'd definitely like to support you coming to New Zealand sometime in the near future. That uh, definitely is gonna happen. That's definitely gonna happen. I don't awesome. know when, but uh, it's still a high on my bucket list and it's gonna happen for sure. Awesome. awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone Thank for coming on. Thanks Riku for doing the interviewing. Um, that's greatly appreciated. And to everyone on Archery New Zealand, the more you keep supporting these things, the more we can keep offering them for you. So please share these events. Like Greku said, we're going to have Gabby on next week. Hasn't even been announced yet, but look out for that very soon because it's going to be really special too. So thank you for your support of this event and we'll see you all next time.
Thanks, Mike. See ya. Thanks, see ya. Thanks, everyone.